Welcome. Welcome to Longmont Public Media's conversation with the candidates for the two at-large positions on city council. I'm Richard Lyons, and I'm here today with candidate Talis Salamatian. Welcome. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate what you're doing for the community by doing this. Good. Thank you. Talis, tell us a little bit about yourself so Longmont can get to know you better. I appreciate the question. Yes, so uh, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I was not born here. I immigrated here when I was uh, young, four years old. Um, grew up in Southern California. Uh, got my M undergrad at UC Santa Cruz in business. Got my MBA in Boston area at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, I've been in entrepreneurship since uh, I was 19 years old when I started my first company while still an undergrad, exited that company shortly after graduating. And um, since then, I really had the entrepreneurial bug. Uh, I've been involved in dozens of companies as a founder, investor, uh, mentor, advisor, fractional CFO. I've helped lots of businesses through my personal mentorship, but also through my involvement with Energize Colorado. Uh, during the pandemic, I've been really focused on helping businesses recover from COVID through my work with the Digital Innovations Initiative of Energize Colorado. And if you check my website, Wendy Lee, who is the uh, head of Energize Colorado, wrote me a quite nice um, testimonial about my involvement with the, with the entity. I, I've also taught business at the University of Colorado hmm. and I have a published book on business. So I can confidently say that I'm the most uh, experienced business person running. Well, it's certainly a varied background. <laughs> Thank you. What one thing do you want the Longmont voters to know about you? I think it's my passion to help people. Um, when, I, when I stopped teaching, I decided to write my book and I didn't price it to be a millionaire. I priced it just above break even so that I could give the most amount of people the ability to learn from my experience. I've had great mentors throughout my life, especially in business and entrepreneurship, and I always believe in paying that forward. So um, giving back is important to me. Uh, when I first started my campaign, I wanted to have a way to interact with the community. And on Nextdoor, I've noticed a lot of people having issues doing small tasks, changing locks, putting up a curtain rod, things of that nature. And so I volunteered my, my help to uh, a lot of people throughout this community to do small tasks that are trivial for me because my father was a contractor. My first job was swinging a hammer and that's what uh, made me want to get into business and out of the 100 degree Bakersfield heat. <laughs> Good. Well, what brought you to Longmont? Great question. So as I was traveling cross, cross country from California to Massachusetts, I fell in love with Colorado. We had the opportunity, my friend and I who were driving cross country, we were only going to stay one day in Colorado. We ended up staying three days because we enjoyed it so much. And it went on my short list for places that I wanted to settle after my MBA. Mm -hmm. My wife, my then girlfriend, now wife, uh, we traveled to several destinations to see where we would want to land because it wasn't feasible to buy a house in the Bay Area where we were. So in 2014, we moved to Boulder County. 2017, I bought my first house in Longmont. Um, this last year, I moved my mom into our first house and was able to buy a second house just three doors down. So uh, I moved my mom here. My dad passed away several years ago. So mm -hmm. I am an only child. So I wanted to make sure that she was nearby. So if, if God forbid anything happened to her, I'd be able to, you know, Take care of her. Sure. Very good. So what do you especially like and don't like about Longmont? Well, the list of things that I like is long. Um, <laughs> the list of things I don't like, I, it's hard to think about. You kind of stumped me on that one. Um, I mean, I, I, I love the community. I love that we have a vibrant business uh, in, uh, ecosystem here. Um, the fact that we have Front Range Community College, uh, which is a great uh, educational institution that pr provides you know, a great service to our community. The fact that we have great nonprofits, the fact that we have very uh, engaged community members with a ton of generosity. I've been always 
floored by the generosity of our community members. Uh, I'm really genuinely have nothing bad to say about my experience being here in Longmont. Good. Let's jump ahead a little bit and assume that you are elected and you're Fingers on crossed. <laughs> <laughs> and you're on city council and the city receives a one million dollar no strings attached grant you can the city council can spend it in any way that it may choose mm -hmm. how would you want to uh, spend that and why so a million dollars doesn't buy you as much as it did uh, a, you know a couple of decades ago but well maybe we <laughs> should say five million or something okay yeah so if, if we get we're given x amount of dollars uh in in millions category I would say that down payment assistance is the number one thing that we should be focusing on. I think that um, there's a emphasis on attainable, uh, sorry, affordable housing, which I think is misplaced. I think we should focus on attainable housing. Uh, my understanding, and this is uh, new information that I've gathered while running for office. One of the great things for running for office is I've, I've learned so much. And one of the things is the difference between attainable and affordable. So affordable housing is essentially just rentals uh, that people are, you know, subs they're subsidized rentals, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, people aren't able to buy and create an essay, create equity, you know, gain from appreciation. None of that's available to someone who is a affordable housing participant. Now, if we gave down payment assistance, um, that would allow people to actually get into a house, gain equity. One third of all of their, their payments would go directly to the principal of the of their note. And, you know, you know, for good or for bad, the appreciation of housing values in our mm -hmm. area has been tremendous. And so anyone who had property uh, have benefited greatly from that. So I, I don't feel like it's a good idea to trap people in rent when they should be able to amass wealth by owning. And that would also address some of the uh, systematic historical um, racist and um, negative impacts to people of color uh, in this nation. Redlining and other preventative measures that were targeted toward black people and people of color mm -hmm. uh, prevented them from owning homes, which I believe contributes to the wealth inequality in this nation. So in my opinion, the best way to amass wealth and to level the playing field for equity and inclusion is through home ownership. Very good, thank you. So tell us, uh, did you have a person that was your mentor or someone that influenced your life? Uh, and if so, can you tell us about that person and how that mentorship or influence occurred? Yeah, uh, a great question. Sorry if I get emotional, but it's my father. Um, you know, he was very courageous, <clears throat> leaving Iran uh, before the revolution, coming to Canada, um, making me, and uh, moving to the United States to uh, have a better life. So he's always been my inspiration. When, when he got brain cancer and I took six months off of being a CEO of the company, of Bozzi Fit, a fitness technology company, to take care of him while he had brain cancer, uh, it, was, it, was, it was important. But um, yeah, he was, he was an entrepreneur. He started a construction company and, <clears throat> pardon me. No problem. Take your time. He invested in my first company that allowed me to be where I'm at today. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Good. Now, are you playing it forward? Are you helping someone, mentoring someone? Oh, yeah, uh, constantly. I, I'm always mentoring people and helping them with their businesses. Um, I still stay in contact with a lot of the students that I taught at CU. Um, many of them have reached out to me for mentorship of their subsequent businesses that they started after my class. So yeah, I feel like every week I have a conversation with someone that I, I've been helping out and mentoring because it is so important. Um, a phrase that my father told me that I live by is, a smart person learns from their mistakes, but a wise person learns from others. And I want to be that other person that helps people who didn't have the privileges that I've had. Very good. It's a good saying. <laughs> um, 
Tell us, uh, Colorado and Longmont uh, both have um, tremendous recreational uh, opportunities. Which do you enjoy and how do you spend your recreational time? Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I own a fitness company, so I try to stay as physically fit and uh, work out as much as I can. I also um, inherited my dad's uh, track road bike, so I've been trying to go in his footsteps. Uh, before he got cancer, he was tr uh, training for a century around uh, um, Lake Tahoe. And so he had this really nice bike, and it was just sitting for a long time, so I started getting into it. And I've been really enjoying it. Uh, I also do a lot of, uh, well, prior to COVID, I was coaching soccer. Uh, my dad was a 20-year soccer coach, and uh -huh. I have been doing that my whole life. Ever since I tore my knee up when I was 18 years old, I, you know, the phrase, you know, if you can't do, you teach or you coach. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been a soccer coach for about a decade, um, t uh, coached at Boulder County Soccer Club, now St. Frayne, and... Um, yeah, it's just really rewarding. I get to just uh, turn off my business brain, just focus with uh, you know being present on the field, coaching the kids, giving them a, a, you know the experience that I had, which I think was very important. Great. Unfortunately, during COVID, the age group that I coached had three teams, and uh, we didn't have enough kids, yeah. so uh, yeah. I was doing it more as a philanthropic thing while the other two coaches were doing as their primary income. So I decided to wait until there's another team that's available. Very good. I'm sure you've been uh, keeping up with this, but it looks like Longmont may switch from the fourth U.S. congressional district to the second. Uh, what impact, if any, do you foresee that having on Longmont? Well, if that's the case, then hopefully we can unseat Bobert or however you pronounce her name. Um, but yeah, I think that um, making sure that the districts are representative of our community is important. Uh, gerrymandering has been something that our uh, nation has been dealing with for, for a while now. Uh, I think that it's very unfair the way some politicians draw the lines of the districts. Uh, I wish there was a better, more equitable way to do so, um, but such as making sausage, um, there, <laughs> you know, things happen and uh, we got to make the best of it. However, you know, I hope that this will allow us to take a tip for the, you know, for the people to have better representation. Okay. Tell us, how, uh, how do you learn and stay informed about local, state and national issues? So I'm an avid reader of The Economist. Uh, I'm a free market capitalist, Keynesonian, if you will, um, classical um, free market person. Uh, so The Economist is my, my primary news source. I, I also stay engaged with the community. When I was collecting signatures, you know, my primary objective, instead of you know spouting out my beliefs, is understanding what was impacting them. And I think that really helped me understand what was most important to our community. So it's a combination between talking with my my friends, my peers, my, people, uh, my other business professionals that I, that I work with and colleagues, as well as uh, the economists. I think that, you know, MSNBC on one side, Fox News on the other side, they're both, you know, very focused on the particular dogma and uh, the economist is more central centrist which is where i find myself i'm a very moderate centrist well you you didn't mention longmont public media but oh, I... oh yeah so I, i'm actually on Longmont <laughs> public media so yeah i i should have absolutely mentioned that i have a show called the savvy entrepreneur so please check that out <laughs> so um i think you we all agree that national politics are very divisive and both absolutely. the federal state levels Although the city council is nonpartisan, some say we're getting, uh, becoming a little more political and a little more divisive. What would you do to keep that divisiveness from occurring in Longmont City Council? Well, I think just being elected, I think that can, will help that. Uh, several of my other candidates are being supported by Longmont area Democrats, which uh, should not be supporting a candidate in my opinion. And I think that if any of those candidates who are being supported by Longmont area Democrats are elected, then it's gonna to contribute to more partisanism. I am a centrist and a moderate, 
So you, if you're voting, I think you can feel free voting for me and not me and me being free of any sort of, you know, political cabal. Very good. Thank you. How do you plan on involving residents, um, the voters, more in the decision making of the city? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and it's I think it's a trade off. I think it's important to get a, a litmus test for what is important to the members of the community. But I also feel as though members of the community don't um, want to be bothered with some of the trivial things that. Uh, they elect someone to take care of for them. I mean, that's why we have a representation in, in a democratic republic rather than a direct democracy. If we had a direct democracy, then we would all vote for everything like they mm -hmm. did in ancient Greece. But we don't. We have a republic where we elect officials who we feel as though can represent our our needs, our desires, our, our aspirations. And I'd like to be that person to um, represent the people who are, you know, struggling to find attainable housing, the people who want their businesses to recover, um, all the people who are struggling with COVID, I, I would like to be, I would like to be your representative. Very good. So uh, tell, uh, tell us if you could change one thing in the municipal uh, code, the current municipal code, what would that be? Um, I'm glad you asked, and it, it may not be uh, the first thing people think about, but when I was talking to voters, one thing that seemed to be a very low-hanging fruit that we can address is the use of gray water. Uh, conservation is important to us. Uh, we, have, we, we live in a high mountain desert, and I think that water is going to be something that is uh, going to be a main talking point for decades to come. So I think it's important we do something now when we have an abundance of, of water and we take conservation seriously. So because there's no permits or um, guidance for use of gray water in, in Longmont, I think that's a very easy fix that can reduce uh, substantially the amount of water that we use on a per person basis. Good. Tell us, um, between the affordable housing and attainable housing issues, you, you alluded to that earlier mm -hmm. uh, in your answers. Um, which do you prioritize as being the greater need for the city? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> tenable housing. If you, if you, I just did the math actually for one of those um, surveys from the interest groups that send you send all the candidates uh, surveys mm -hmm. to to respond, and that I was doing math, and if we can average out appreciation for the next fourteen years. Um, about ten percent uh, appreciation in house values, and if you compare that to uh, like a five percent increase in rent per year for the next fourteen years, then the person who bought a house uh, versus person who was renting, even though the renter didn't have to worry about the upkeep costs, and I'm assuming that's going to be about three to four thousand dollars a year. If you average all that out and you do all the math, um, the person who bought the house is about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars ahead of the person that got the affordable housing. Sure, affordable housing is important for people who have disabilities, people who have the inability to, to make uh, the money required to, to own a home. So it's important that you know, everyone's housed. I, 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 we have a ho horrible homeless problem here. We have 1% mm -hmm. uh, you know, of our population homeless and then you know, up to you know, 4,000 to 5,000 kids and, and that are doubling up in the houses are, are close to uh, being homeless. So it's, 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 it's a tragedy that we have there. So I, don't get me wrong, affordable housing is, is very important for those members of our community. But I think if we were to generalize, I think that attainable housing is, has much higher benefit to the, the individual. Very good. Well, Talis, I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, come down here this morning. Oh, Richard, never too busy to talk to you. <laughs> well, thank you very much and good luck with your campaign. And thank you for what you're doing here. This is a great um, benefit to our community. So I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Yeah, thank you.